I went from for autodidactomy with facelift towards Jacono style uh, deep play yeah. facelift. Yeah. I went the other way around, uh, more or well, less. Yes, but it's fun. It's uh, uh, I think if you do rhinoplasty and it's enough, it's good. Yeah. But like this Ray Dalio says, it, that's your uh, your gold nugget that you're searching for. And you're trying to have a nice life while escaping mediocrity and boredom. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're already in season four. So these seasons, this season is all about getting that golden nugget. And I've got quite a nuggety guy on the show today. Guy who I really enjoy spending time with. Super sense of humor. Hardworking, doesn't tolerate fools lightly. But uh, yeah, very nice guy. Peter Lohaus, welcome to today's episode. Nice to be here. It's great to see you again, man. It's, it's been a, been a while. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, w- what's been happening in your life since we last had you on the show? We uh, that was in the coffee time, right? Yes. And, uh, then it was for us uh, still busy because this Zagreb we closed down only one month. We were in the building process, and now we are two two and a half years further. And we uh, came quite the way. We're gonna open a second location. Uh, our practice has increased, and it's getting more and more busy. So, Peter, how much time are you spending in Croatia nowadays? Are you still between the Netherlands and Croatia? Yes, sorry, it's had to be really efficient, but um, yeah, what we are a small hospital, so there's also other doctors working. Mm. They kind of reserve the, the cases that they want to reserve or specific patients that want to be operated by me. And, uh, um, yeah, I I'd go every five weeks uh, for uh, a short period okay. works best. Yeah. You know, one of the things I really enjoy now, we, we're on a couple of uh, like discussion platforms, as it were, WhatsApp groups and stuff is, you've got a very diverse practice. I mean, you do a lot of reconstructive stuff as well. Hey? Yes, I do head and neck surgery, ablative, but also reconstructive. Uh, I, in COVID time, I became somnologist. Yeah, yeah. Yes, there's uh, for a practice in Zagreb, really important. I do rhinoplasty and full facial plastic, uh, especially in Zagreb. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're also not a guy we necessarily pin one thing to because we, we got you, we've got so many different things. But the one thing that really stands out, or one of the things, is patient-related outcome measures. So tell the listeners a little bit more about your 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 yeah the 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 different ones that you've already been involved in, and they've been published in various languages around uh, the world and yeah there's there's two sides to it one is uh, um it's good right? it's really good so uh i wanted to know for example uh, uh, how i was doing with my rhinoplasty patients yes. i didn't want to go to an extended form because then they don't feel like filling it in anymore yes so i developed this short questionnaire uh like it based uh for quality of life a visual analog scale with it and with that, you could easily measure, but first you had to validate yes. that it actually measures what it should measure. Yes. And I went to that process, uh, we call it the Utrecht questionnaire. And that really helped to publish things to see how I was doing. My patients were uh, went up a certain level. Fellows my copied that uh, questionnaire. You know, they were a little bit less, but they saw that themselves improve as well in time. It was a good way to kind of measure how good you were doing. Yeah. And also it was a good way to communicate with patients um, on which side of the curve they would be. Hey, would they be uh, uh, better than expected or less than expected, for example, okay. if they had thick skin? So for me, that was a valuable tool. And I think other doctors uh, thought that as well because they copied it in Portuguese and, and S- Spanish, I think, Turkish. Yes. Uh, Persian, uh, many languages, yeah. Yeah was a good, good thing. You can overdo it, and uh, we, we don't want to tire our patients down with too many questions. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so we, you have to find something that you see how you're doing, but you don't exhaust the patients with... Uh, and do you routinely, every patient goes over it? For rhinoplasty, yes. Yeah. For the, the, the major things, yes. Yeah. Uh, for the small things, it's just uh, eye-to-eye contact, ask, and get a feel yeah, yeah. how you're doing. Yeah. But if you want to publish something about especially rhinoplasty because it's so, such a big variation and it's hard to 
and of uh, the CD outcome because it's subjective. Yes. Then uh, you, I think you need a, a good measurement tool, which is simple, uh, like we developed. So Peter, uh, what I like about you is your forthrightness. I want to ask you a bit of your opinion on this like dead horse that keems to be flogged about preservation of rhinoplasty. You know, I think sometimes it's a bandwagon people want to get onto, but I'm very interested to know what Peter Lohaus thinks about that, eh? Let's be careful from now. Uh, you know, there was a time that for head and neck and for other stuff, we went into minimal invasive, okay, which was good. Yeah. But in a way, a lot of people were doing minimal invasive for rhinoplasty already. Mm. Now, uh, preservation sounds like you're preserving more than you actually did in the past. Mm. And that might not really be true. Sometimes it's really aggressive. Yes. It's not uh, preservation, yeah. but it's it it suits a certain purpose. Okay. For everything in medicine, it's like individualized. You have yeah. uh, for uh, 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 sleep, you have certain different things. Some people need CPAP, some need an oral device, some people need surgery, or they get a high velocity stimulation. It's individualized. Absolutely. Same with rhinoplasty. Okay. There's good indications for preservation of rhinoplasty and then you do it. But in the end, it's a mixture between structural and preservation. And you try to improve yourself as a surgeon. That means that you get a huge box of armamentarium tools yes. that you can grab from. And in those hard cases where it's not always the same, you can pick out different things and get to a good end result. Because yes. in the end, value is what matters. Yes. They, they want to be treated well have a good result, which is, in their perspective, a good result, not only in your perspective. And uh, uh, it, you have many, many different ways to approach that, and preservation is one of them. Cool. But structural, it, I think, is the basis. That's where Yeah, yeah of course. So, uh, Peter, tell me, I want to come back to you. Do you have fellows that work under you or not? Yes. So, for the head and neck, we have fellow every year. Um, for the reconstruction, that's a further specialization. For the uh, facial plastic surgery, we have... Uh, uh, every six month new fellow, so we have one and a half fellow. So, so explain that to me. I want to try and understand because there are obviously people who'd be keen on doing a fellowship under you because of you of your broad skill set. But so you've got the office in Zagreb. Yes. And the office in Yes. So we, we have had a neck uh, fellows there. We have facial plastic that's in Amsterdam. Yeah. We have facial plastic fellows in Zagreb. Okay. There we have many doctors working, most urologists. Okay. Uh, general plastic surgeons, so they are uh, embedded in our practice for a year. They help with uh, the Vectra, uh, yeah. the analysis, yeah. they write one or two papers, and they assist with the surgery, uh, and um, that's a really good year. Best thing, I think, for that fellowship is that you see what is the normal standards. You know, they, they get a feeling, they get tissue handling, uh, they see what is normal, and they know, right, that this is the level that we have to reach, or better. And we yeah, yeah. stand on their shoulders and we get yeah. one level uh, higher. That is what we do with the, with our fellowship. And our luck is that we do the full scope, from fillers to peeling to laser to facelift to rhinoplasty. Yeah. And uh, they see it all. And uh, um, we it's really fun. It's really fun to have the fellows. They learn a lot. They keep you kind of... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we are really happy with it. Uh, we, we had one a year. Now we are increasing to one and a half a year. So they have one period of six months together, which they can teach each other. Okay, first that's quite good. Yeah, the first phase they... And, and is that... So the, the, the head and neck fellow, who's that kind of run through? And who's the facial plastic one run through? The facial plastic is usually from the facial plastic, Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. We are... Uh, how do you say it? Yeah, if all this it. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, head and neck is something completely different. Uh, that's a diff they want to be had an ex-surgeon or free flap surgery. Yeah, yeah. So that's a different stream. Okay. But what we do is the facial plastics sometimes come one month to Amsterdam to also get like a... Ah, uh, clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but it's two different streams. And and those those fellowships are possibly open for international candidates? Uh, yes, we have international candidates also outside of Europe. For us, it's important that they commit one year okay. to us. Yeah. And uh, in the Netherlands... That's a little bit harder because there it's also seeing patients and they need to speak the language much better. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of it is documentation, thinking, preparation for meetings. In our uh, uh, clinic, 
it's mainly surgical and surgical related. Okay. Yes. For those there as well, but yeah, it, it has more things yeah. to it too. So Peter, I'm reminded by a few years ago, I was chatting to Rod Rorick. I was so enthralled by how busy he is and he's running around and doing all this stuff. And I asked him, I said, hey, prof, where do you find time for academics? And he turned to me and he said, Cameron, academia is a state of mind, so. And I thought it, it strikes me that for you as well, you, you love academia, but you're quite busy in, in working at the same time, eh? Yes, I, I must say that uh, in the end, when you get more and more busy, you have to kind of cut certain things. Yeah. So I wrote two books. I'm never going to do that again. Yeah. Because there's so many people doing it. It right. won't add anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, papers sometimes about a special case or a theory. But to be honest, if we would publish fibula cases, it's like a hundred. In China, they do like a thousand. Yes. They do it well. It's much better that they do it there. Yeah. So you, the purpose of writing kind of decreases. That saves a lot of time. But then... Um, Thinking in quality and reading, of yeah. course, is a way of life. Yeah. So I think that's what Rory is uh, meant. And that's fine. But you, you start uh, decreasing your uh, share of uh, publishing. For sure, of course. Peter, what's your secret to being in the shape you in? Fit, healthy guy. It's a habit. Actually, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Good friends of mine are uh, professional athletes. I, I train with them, so I pay. And uh, they keep me fit. And uh, but it's a habit. If you do that four times a day, you don't eat too much. Yeah. And then um, let's say again, to fit uh, uh, cardiovascular, rate, but at least you're you're not getting uh, too much weight. Yeah. Yes. I had a I had an interesting um, chat with Imra Ilhan in in the previous season of the podcast, and he was talking about meditation and how much he uses that to kind of decrease his stress levels. Well, I think medit. There's a guy, Ray Dalio, which I really like, and he is a good thinker. And he also is always saying that meditation, you have to see it like this, where you do a rugby game or a tennis game, that's also a form of meditation because it's hyper-focus. So whether you sit and do meditation or you play a match yeah. or uh, 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 an hour, it's, I think it's the same thing because you know, you're doing so many movements that there's no way you can think about something else. And... Uh, but that's in a way surgery as well. I mean, you yes. are absolutely yeah. in the zone. Yes. Yeah, they're here in the zone. But that's a good thing about surgery. It, it's uh, Frank Gamer always used to say, but I never understood what he meant. He said, Peter, surgery is a jealous mistress. <laughs> I started thinking, what does he mean? Does he mean? But, you know, it's hard on the body, uh, yeah, you know, in a way, but it's also nice uh, 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 to do it because you get in the zone and time passes by like very quickly. Yeah. So you, we're having very nice jobs, actually. Yeah? We do nice things. We do surgery. We can meet, make people happy. And in, in the meantime, we're doing meditation and we're in the zone. Wow. You're nailing it all of it. Okay. My last question that I have. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to take out what you're saying. I think what's nice about this podcast is people can re-listen and just, there's a, just everyone gets a little something out of it. Is So the guys who purely dedicated to Rhino Blast. I mean, I've seen your Instagram results. It's fantastic. You had brilliant results. But what I don't understand is how you managed to also do head and neck stuff and all the other facial plastic stuff. To get that balance, it's, it's, it's quite a rare thing, right? It's a rare thing, but it, it started just when I was a fellow. So I did fellow first for facial plastic, then head and neck, then reconstructive. I was in the center, the Netherlands Cancer Institute, which it was perfect center because we had very rare cases. And that center kind of made me big in a sense because I could, you know, uh, do all the cases I wanted. I had freedom, I had bosses or a blaze ablative, but he gave me the chance to kind of start doing the free flaps. And then we had a team, so it became easier. Now we are with four guys, we share the load. It, the, 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 the reconstructive also brought the, the aesthetics, uh, uh, um, I'm not doing fillers or Botox, you know, I kind of left that, but you know, the, 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 the things which require a little bit more surgery are easily combined. And when you like it, uh, I talked about that in the book with the rhinoplasty learning curve, mm. you get in that zone that you don't need so much surgery of everything, but still can keep all the balls yeah. in the air. And it's, yeah. that is very diverse and very nice, actually. So it's I like to do a facelift, but not every day. Yes. But in the end, it's the same as doing a deep prostatectomy. Actually, I, I went from prostatectomy with facelift towards Jacono-style uh, deep yeah. plane facelift. Yeah. 
I went the other way around. Uh, I said more or less. Yes. So it's fun. It's, uh, uh, I think if you do rhinoplasty and it's enough, it's good. Yeah. But like this Ray Dalio says, it, that's your, uh, your gold nugget that you're searching for. You're trying to have a nice life while escaping mediocrity and boredom. And if you're on that road, but you are doing exactly the same yeah, yeah. with uh, all that activity that you explore in uh, South Africa, and then you, uh, you do okay until, until the end is near. That's it. That's it, guys. Well, there you've heard it, eh? Um, Peter, listen, eh, good luck for, for your exciting projects that you guys are doing, eh? Thank you. And, um, yeah, man, I, I hope you have a very, very good 2024. And thanks again for everything you've done, eh? I mean, that you touched a question there. I don't think you would have thought all those years ago it would have the effect that it's had on the, on in Rwanda. Uh, I'm not really sure, but no, it's, you know, a lot of people use it and it's, uh, it helps them a lot and it helped me a lot as well. Awesome. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Peter, thanks for your time. And uh, come back again next week for another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests. Music